Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between an employee of an airline company and a customer. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 6. GB Airlines, uh, this is Kyle speaking. How can I help? Hi, my name is Matt Walsh. I'm calling on behalf of Mr. John Sparrow to claim expenses for a delay in his flight last week. Good morning, Mr. Walsh. Uh, thank you for calling. Could you please tell me the flight number and the date of departure? The date of departure was the 24th of January, 2016. I'm afraid I don't have the flight number in front of me at the moment. OK, that's all right. One moment. Uh, could you tell me where was Mr. Sparrow departing from? He was departing from Athens. Uh, is that Athens, Greece or Athens, Georgia? Athens, Greece. Right. And what was the destination? It was Heathrow, London. Right. We've got two flights from Athens to London, Heathrow, on the 24th of January 2016. Was it the 3.25pm flight or the 9.45pm? It was the later one, 945. OK, so the flight number is GB1011. Right, OK. OK, yes. I can see that Mr Sparrow's flight was cancelled and he was booked on the next flight on the 25th of January at 3.25pm. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. According to our system, one of my colleagues spoke with Mr Sparrow on the phone on the 24th to inform him of the cancellation and offered to book a hotel for him for the night, but Mr Sparrow preferred to book one himself. Yes, because he didn't want to stay near the airport, as the next flight was in the afternoon. Yes, of course. Uh, could you tell me which hotel he stayed at? Yes, he stayed at the Hypnos Hotel. Oh, uh, could you spell that for me? Of course. That's H-Y-P-N-O-S. Right. Uh, thank you for that. And could you please tell me how much the total cost was for the night? Sure. It was 73 euros. Right. Uh, do you have a copy of the receipt for that? Yes, of course. Would you like me to send it to you? Uh, yes, please. Can I email a picture of it to you? Absolutely. Uh, the email address is refunds at gbairlines.co.uk. Great, thank you. No problem. Uh, were there any other expenses you wish to claim? Actually, yes. There was also the taxi ride to the airport and the taxi ride back the next day. Right. And what was the total cost? Um, the first taxi ride was 53 euros and the second one was 42. So 63, 73, 83. Yeah, so the total was 95 euros. I'll send you the receipt for those as well. Thank you. Uh, are there any other expenses? No, I think that's it. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 7 to 10. Excellent. So if you could please send us the receipts for the hotel and the taxi rides, and after we receive them it should take about 48 hours for the funds to reach Mr Sparrow's account. Perfect. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, yes. There's one more thing. Um, Mr Sparrow complained about the meal during the flight. He said that it was a bit bland. Right. So he asked me if it was possible to switch to a different meal option for his upcoming flight to Kiev next week. Right, of course. Uh, just give me a minute, please. Right, I see that Mr Sparrow had the light meal option for his flight to London, and you would like to change that. Uh, what would you like to change it to? What are the other options? We've got 12 different meal options. Uh, would you like me to list all of them for you? Well, Mr Sparrow has told me that he would prefer something without meat. 
How many of these do not contain meat? We've got three meal options without meat. Uh, we've got the vegetarian option, the vegan option, and the Asian vegetarian. What's the difference? There's a variety of different dishes served with each option. Uh, for example, next week, the vegetarian option will be a small spinach and feta cheese pie, a bread roll, a salad, and tropical fruit. And the vegan option? The vegan option doesn't include any dairy products, and it also doesn't include fowl, eggs, or honey. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have the specific menu for this week, but I can email it to you as soon as it becomes available. Oh, could you do that? That would be great. Yes, of course. Uh, I can email you a detailed description of all the meal options if you like. Yes, please. No problem. Uh, please do not forget to call us back to change the meal option. Uh, you need to do that 48 hours before the departure time for international flights and 24 hours for domestic flights. So 48 hours for this one then? Yes, exactly. Perfect. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, transatlantic flights require 48 hours. All flights within Europe require 24 hours. So in this case, you will need to call us 24 hours in advance. Um, I apologize for that. Okay, great. So, could I please have your email address so I can send you the menus? Certainly. It's matt.walsh at sparrowlimited.com. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk on ginseng. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good morning. Today we'd like to talk with Mr. Schumacher of Kaiser Farms. Mr. Schumacher, what is in ginseng that makes it so special? Thanks. The key elements in ginseng are the active ingredients known as ginsengosides. All true ginseng products on the market contain a certain percentage of ginsenosides and a number of factors determine how much. The age of Wisconsin ginseng when harvested plays a major role in determining the natural level of ginsenosides. Tests have shown that the older the plant, the higher the ginsenoside content. Five-year-old Wisconsin ginseng plants have had ginsenoside levels as high as 20%. As a family operation, one of our strategies in producing the highest quality product available is to only harvest four- and five-year-old roots. The majority of Wisconsin ginseng harvested is three years old. The reason for this is that the expenses to care for and the possibility of disease increase as the plants become older. By limiting the amount of ginseng that we plant each year, we are able to provide the necessary attention and care to produce the highest quality four- and five-year-old roots. Now look at questions 15 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 15 to 20. What is Wisconsin ginseng used for? There are two real species of ginseng on the market today, Panax, Korean or Chinese, and Panax, Quinquefolius, Wisconsin. 
Since ginseng has been used for thousands of years in China, it is easiest to explain the differences in ginseng by using traditional Chinese herbal philosophy. Wisconsin ginseng is considered a cooling type herb, and Korean or Chinese ginseng are considered heating type herbs. As a cooling herb, Wisconsin ginseng is used as a preventative medicine. Here in the United States, Wisconsin ginseng is considered an adaptogen. As an adaptogen, Wisconsin ginseng acts to normalize body functions and strengthen the immune system and other systems in the body. Over a longer period of time, it builds up energy and maintains the body at a higher level, acting to reduce stress and fatigue. As a heating herb, Panax ginseng is used more as a stimulant and is often prescribed in China when the body is recovering from an illness and is worn down and in need of a rapid boost of energy. It is only recommended to be taken over short periods of time and not continuously. Wisconsin ginseng is considered the premier ginseng in China because it can be taken on a continuous basis and acts as a preventative type medicine by slowly building up the body. Wisconsin ginseng fits in perfectly with the Chinese herbal philosophy of preventative type medicine. Unlike here in the US, where we often wait until we are ill to seek medical attention, the traditional Chinese medicinal philosophy concentrates on building up the body to prevent illness. Based on the way Wisconsin ginseng has been prescribed in China, it is the correct ginseng to be taken for the majority of the consumers. Travel to China and see firsthand the ginseng that is considered the world's finest ginseng. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students who will discuss a project they're working on together. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 27. Hey Jess, glad you could make it. We've got a lot to discuss. Hi Matt. Yes, sorry I'm a bit late. I did bring all my notes with me. Yes, me too. Where shall we start? Well, I think it would be a good idea to clarify our objectives just one more time. Yes, good idea. Okay, here we are. We need to record, photograph and identify the plant species in 10 one square meter plots. Does it say anything about where these plots should be and how they should be laid out? Ah, here it is. It says that all the plots need to be no more than 10 metres apart. And how do we choose them? Ah, this is the fun part. I remember this. Here we are. Make a one metre square frame using bamboo sticks available from the department stores. Yes, we've, we've already done that. I know, I'm just reading the whole section. OK. One person stands roughly in the middle of the chosen area and throws the frame. The other person uses a tape to mark out the square where the frame landed and returns frame to thrower. The thrower then turns a few degrees on the spot and throws again. The thrower must turn slightly after each throw and vary the force of the throw until after the tenth throw they are pointing in almost the same direction as the first. That sounds a bit complicated. That's only because it's all in writing. 
It's just a simple throw, turn, throw, turn, throw, turn until we have ten squares. And I guess you want to do the throwing. Well, if you don't mind. I'm sure you'll be more accurate at marking the squares. Yes, I am sure I am, and I'm sure you've got a stronger throwing arm. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 28 to 30. OK, good. We've got that sorted. Now we need to decide where to go. Yes, I've been thinking about that and I've brought the map. Ah, well done. I forgot mine. Now, I've identified three possible locations, but they've all got some disadvantages. OK, fire away. Well, the area around this lowland marsh could be interesting. There'll be a lot of interesting water plants here. Looks good, but what's the problem? Mainly that it's already a designated nature reserve, and I think there's already been a lot of research done here. Ah, I see. Well, I'd rather do something that's new and can be useful. I agree. That's why I identified this area further west. See, here, behind the beach. Oh yes, I see. That area there, where it's flat, but quite high. Exactly. If you look a bit further inland, you'll see that there are hills which will protect that area from strong north winds. I see. Excellent. But what's the problem? Just that it may not be very interesting. We know that the geology there is not conducive to a wide variety of plants. Mm, I agree. So what's your last idea? Well, I think this one is a bit of a winner, although I did want to show you the other two. Look up here, on the north coast. Where? See, this bay? Well, I know that there's been quite a lot of studies done here, but a bit further to the east, behind this headland. No one has ever looked at that. Well, I certainly couldn't see any studies. That is interesting. And the plant life could be a bit different because of the shelter from the wind the headland provides. Exactly. Brilliant, Jessica. That's a great idea. We'll go there. Thanks. Now all we have to decide is when is a good time. Well... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning and welcome to this talk on Canada. Many people think of Canada as a land of ice and snow. They think of it as a young country with few inhabitants, a country of English-speaking white people. While some of this is true, 
It is also an inaccurate description of the country we call Canada. Canada lies in the northern half of the continent of North America. The most northern parts of Canada are sometimes called the land of the midnight sun, because at certain times of the year the sun never sets and is still shining faintly at midnight. This northern part of Canada is cold and mostly snow covered all year round. Most of the people who live in this northern part of Canada are called Inuit or Dene. They were once called Eskimos. They are the original people of this land and are part of what are called the First Nation. As we move to the more southern parts of Canada, the land changes and so does the people. Moving from east to west in southern Canada, we travel from the Atlantic provinces of Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island. These small provinces with small populations border on the Atlantic Ocean. The land in these provinces is not very fertile, so fishing, forestry, and mining are the main industries, although in some small areas, Agriculture is also important. If we travel west from the Atlantic provinces, we come to central Canada, composed of the large provinces of Quebec and Ontario. Both provinces are rich in natural resources, have fertile land, and are the centres of industry for Canada's largest cities. Toronto and Montreal are found in these provinces. The province of Quebec is the centre of French language and culture in Canada. In fact, Montreal is the second largest French speaking city in the world after Paris. Finally, in the far west of Canada, we come to the province of British Columbia. This province is separated from the prairies by the Rocky Mountains and is bounded on the west by the Pacific Ocean. British Columbia is often called simply the West Coast. British Columbia is an attractive place for tourists because of its mild climate, spectacular mountains, sea coast, and beautiful forests. Agriculture, forestry, shipping, and fishing are major industries in British Columbia. The people of this land of Canada are as varied as its landscape. The original settlers, those we call the people of the First Nations, Came from Asia by crossing the Bering Strait from Siberia to Alaska. In their new environment, they developed many new languages and cultures. In the 16th century, the first Europeans arrived in eastern Canada. They came from Britain and France. By making treaties with the original inhabitants, they gradually established colonies in eastern and central Canada. After a war with France, Britain took over the French colonies in Quebec and eastern Canada. By the end of the 18th century, all of Canada was under British rule. From this time until the present century, most of the immigrants to Canada were British, Scottish, and Irish. In this century, however, Canada has had an influence of settlers from all over the world. There are now hundreds of thousands of people from Asia, Africa, and South America. Who now call Canada their home. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.